Rob is a multi-time entrepreneur and the co-founder of the data and security company Splunk. Um, if you don't know Splunk, he took it from zero to IPO and is now one of the Bay Area's largest employers. Guiding our talk today is Lorez, who is one of the more prominent business leaders in the North Bay as publisher of the North Bay Business Journal. Take it away, Lorez. Thank you. I'm really excited to be with Rob in this first conversation of many conversations, but I'm glad that we're kicking it off. Thanks so much for Zach for having us and for the uh, North Bay Next crew and team for all of their work arranging this conversation today and getting me an opportunity to get to know Rob better. Thank you. First question, Rob. You have been involved with or co-founded many startup companies. What inspired you to become a serial entrepreneur? Wow. Um, yeah, I've, so I've um, been a member of eight startup companies and co-founded three, um, all in software business. So if I apologize in advance if most of what I talk about is software oriented. I know a lot of people in this room are not software people, but it's what I know best. I've been doing it for 35 years, so I apologize in advance. Um, I've worked at both large companies and small companies, and I found um, uh, that large companies, I had, a, a, had trouble feeling ownership. Um, many projects I've worked on have been canceled after putting two or three years of super hard work into it, just because they're, they're like at the, is it working still? Testing, <laughs> testing. Uh, I'll try to be loud. Um, basically, they didn't want to put marketing dollars into things, but th and then they tell you two or three years into it, and you have four or five employees, um, you know, working for you in your group, and all of a sudden the thing is gone. It's kind of disheartening. You know, the work is very satisfying while you're doing it, but then all of a sudden not being able to see customers use it is really, really sad. Um, after doing many, many, many projects for big big companies. I met my, uh, my co-founder, Eric, um, at a place called Taligent. And um, Eric and I were working on a project and decided that we um, weren't getting anywhere with this project, like <laughs> we had done on many others at large companies. And um, it just so happened to be that the company Taligent uh, is, a is a joint venture between Apple, IBM, and HP decided um, that they were going to get acquired 100% by IBM, and they were offering early, um, early payouts to people to leave. And so Eric and I said, you know what, we're going to take some of the stuff we've learned here and we're going to do our own thing. And so um, that's how we started the f first company that I was uh, uh, a co-founder of. And then Eric and I uh, ended up working together for many, many years after that. And Eric is, m what is my partner was my partner uh, also at Splunk, which I'll tell you about in a little bit. But, uh, yep. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. And we are going to ask you what Splunk is. And as a person who really prides themselves on doing their research, going LinkedIn, I still have no clue. <laughs> you know, what Splunk, we've had dinner, we've hung out, <laughs> wine, and I'm still, so, I, so when I ask this question, I humbly say, you know, for those of us who don't know what Splunk is, can you give us a brief overview? Well, first of all, I'd like to see a show of hands of people that don't know what Splunk is. <laughs> oh my God, like 50%, okay. Well, that's not too bad. Um, <laughs> well, first of all, Splunk is a play on words for spelunking, which is going into caves and cave diving. And uh, uh, Eric and I, uh, Eric came up with that name actually. And uh, uh, basically, we had looked at all kinds of things that, uh, problems that we had in previous, previous jobs. You know, what are the big problems? What problems do we want to solve moving forward? What, what were like real pain points for us? And um, came up with this, this name Splunk, which uh, was, you know, we found that when people were debugging these large complex systems, it was like going into a cave with no headlamp and no hip waders, total, total blindness. You couldn't see anything. And so I came up with the name, trying to build, the idea was to build software that gave you the visibility of trying to find these really complex problems in, uh, in really large software stacks. And so that's where the name came up. Uh, basically what it is, is it's a system that takes um, real-time events, 
So think of an event as something which is time-stamped. Uh, computers leave these events behind to uh, keep track of things, and what we did is ingested all of these events, put it into a search engine, allowed people to find a needle in a hay haystack, but then to also pull this data up and perform analytics on it. It turns out that in these events, there are, it, there are tons, of there's tons of business information. So it's not just about finding problems, but then being able to provide analytics and dashboards about how your company is being run in real time, or how to um, find security breaches and then prevent them from happening again in the future. So now Splunk is used by 90% um, of the Fortune 500. Um, there are some customers that are paying $10 million a year annually for it. Um, there's 8,000 employees all over the world. And um, it went public in 2012. Um, about a 14 or $15 billion market cap. How did you come up with the idea and what made this different than other startup attempts that you had done in the past? Um, so, so we uh, looked back and said, um, what are some of the worst problems that we had that we saw over and over at other places that we had worked together? And have those problems been solved? And um, went out uh, when we decided to start this company and decided we weren't going to write any software, we weren't going to do anything except ask, is identify the problem and then go out and ask people all over, all over the world in all different kinds of businesses whether this was a problem that they had and how they solved it. So we went 18 months by just asking the question, you know, how do you guys solve problems in these complex infrastructures and what do you do to solve it? And everything, everything came back. Like 100% of these people said, we all have this problem, it's huge, it takes us forever to find any problem in these systems and, um, and we fix it in a manual way by getting everybody together in a war room and hashing it out. And we said, well, there's gotta be a better way to do this and uh, we came up with that idea. So this is a question we all wonder about anything. Where's the money, really? But how did you fund it, right? Because I think that's a big part of what, you know, why Zach has created these opportunities. But funding, money, right? How do you take something, an idea, but then find the backing and the finance to make it happen? Is this working again? Oh, good. <laughs> um, well, we first sort of self-funded it by using credit cards. <laughs> taking um, uh, home equity loans, eating rice cakes, getting yelled at by our wives, like really seriously yelled at. Um, it was really hard. It was two years with no salary, a little bit of money left over from leaving Taligent, and uh, uh, one of the most difficult periods of my life, because I had all this inf you know, overhead, the house, the mortgage, kids, like all, the, all this, and no, no income coming in for almost two years. Um, you know, we were in our mid-40s, which is a pretty, uh, pretty, pretty old to be raising venture capital around a software startup, okay? Um, we brought in another, another partner, Michael. Um, Michael knew a lot of venture capital people. We marched up and down Sand Hill Road looking for, looking for money. So. Um, eventually, we were able to uh, close on a $5 million round. So there was no angels. Um, we closed on that round uh, with a PowerPoint presentation and a demo that had no technology in it. And uh, the, 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 the VC people loved the fact that we had been involved with so many startups and, uh, that, and they believed that we learned from our failures as well as from our successes and they were willing to uh, make that investment. Uh, we ended up taking a total of $40 million over uh, um, three years um, a, with a B and a C round and in Silicon Valley for an enterprise software company that's actually not a lot of money but we never spent all of it because we we're actually cash flow positive in, this, in our, our early third year. When we were preparing for this, we talked a lot about you know, you're a, you're a humble leader, right? You're a, a humble guy, smart, very smart person. What kinds of things 
foundational tenets kept you guys moving forward in the work and was the foundation of how you wanted to accomplish this uh, new adventure? Well, thanks for calling me smart. Um, <laughs> I don't know, I'm not so smart as, I'm not as smart as I used to be. I'm drinking too much wine or something. Um, up in Healdsburg. Um, you are definitely living your best life. <laughs> <laughs> life's good. Yeah, life's um, good. Well, let's see. We, we wanted to build software that we wanted to use, all right? In a previous job, uh, we had guys in suits and ties come from Oracle, and we thought they were going to come with baseball bats and kneecap us when we didn't pay our, uh, uh, pay our invoice on time. We didn't want to be those people. We wanted to be the friends, literally the friends of, uh, of and, and build a community around our software and around people that had the same pain points that that we had. So uh, we wanted to build software that we wanted. We wanted to be humble. We wanted, we wanted to um, target the people that were the actual users, not the, the C-level people uh, out on the golf course, which is the way the enterprise software was typically sold. Um, we wanted this concept of a five-minute aha, which means that now this is back before there was cloud software. Um, people would download it, and when they downloaded it, we wanted them to be able to understand what it was, how it worked, and go and have the light bulb go off within five minutes. Believe me, that was probably the most difficult part. How do you take something super complex like this and get people to, to have a light bulb go off in five minutes just from downloading something off of an ad on the internet? That was like super hard. But uh, those are some of the basic tenets. You, well, we talked about Funding, right? That's important. But there's a human side. Like, how did you find the first people? You said, you know, we wanted to work with people, like-minded people we like. But we also talked about how it's important to have people from diverse backgrounds and perspectives. So how did you find, you know, we're, we're having people here that are um, having the entrepreneurial spirit. They want to have people come work with them, for them, be inspired by the work. So how did you find those first few staff and employees when you were in the beginning phases? Well, have, well, being in the industry for so many years previous to starting this company, we knew a lot of people. And, you know, the people that we initially needed were software engineers. And we had, we had a group of people that we were friends with. And we, you know, we'd go out with them. They were our friends. They'd come over to our house. And so we knew what their capabilities were. We knew what they weren't good at. We knew what they were good at. And we, you know, with our new $5 million, because they weren't going to join us when we had nothing, um, said, yeah, uh, we'd, love to, we'd love to work with you guys again, because they must have thought that what we were doing was interesting. And we were really happy with that. And that got us to the point where, uh, you know, where we could show the software to, to customers, potential customers, and where we could go to trade shows and things like that. But it never, that didn't really give us everything we needed to really scale this thing to the next level, um, both from a software perspective or from a business perspective. So at that point, we all knew that we needed to, you know, we all listened to the same music. We, we were the same people. We had speakers in the office. We turned it up. And at some point, it's like, you know what? We need to get different people in here. We need to get people that like different kind of music than the kind that we like. And um, we started going on the Friends of Friends Network, and we found some people that really, really excelled at what we needed them to excel, and it took a really long time. We say, we say, say hire slow, fire fast, you know, really get people that are uh, really, really solid, take your time finding them, making sure that they're the right sort of people, they fit into the environment, and if there's somebody who's toxic, get rid of them immediately, because it can have a really detrimental effect on the business. And we just applied that and, uh, and ran with it. Well, what do you think was the turning point that really put Splunk on the map? <laughs> Actually, it was kind of lucky. We, uh, um, we went to a trade show in 2005 called Linux World at the Moscone Center in San Francisco. And at the time, Linux was really starting to take off um, you know, as, as, as you know, a different operating system than Windows or the, or the Mac especially in, in, in data centers, it was really starting to take off. So it was a big conference, and there were a lot of really big companies there from Cisco to IBM to 
whoever, big companies like that. And way in the back corner, there's our little 10 foot, 12 foot booth. And, um, you know, with a big black curtain on it that said Splunk. And it's like, what the hell is Splunk? And so um, we had this t shirt, and we invented a t shirt we were going to give to everybody if they would come and they would do a, a, get a little personal demo. The t shirt said, Take the SH out of IT. And everybody loved that T-shirt, and everybody wanted that T-shirt really bad. Mm -hmm. Now, on t do you have that T-shirt? I have that T-shirt from that show. <laughs> oh, awesome. you got to talk to me afterwards. So Apple just came out with these 30-inch monitors, and nobody in the industry had ever seen 30-inch monitors before. And we were some of the first, actual first people to acquire these monitors. So everybody in the show wanted to see these new Apple monitors. But we also made him get a t-shirt, and, and so people were standing in line 10, 15 deep. All the poor other startup companies had nobody at their booths, and they're like, what the hell is this company over here? <laughs> anyway, when they started looking at the software, they were like, oh my god, not only are the t-shirts cool, and uh, these monitors are cool, but this software's kind of interesting too. And we actually won uh, best of show for a smaller company uh, with that software that was um, kind of cobbled together. And so uh, that was really the turning point, then we started getting press all over the place. So it's kind of funny that t-shirts and monitors would have something to do with this. Who knew t-shirts could change the world? Yeah, and maybe if you get me sometime in private today, I'll tell you what the original t-shirt idea was. <laughs> it was really, really bad, and if we had gone out with that one instead, we never would have been able to do this. I want to talk to you a little bit about how you built a repeatable sales model, but I want to come back to, we're talking about all the successes. So you must have never made a mistake, never had a oh mm, moment, you know. So can you talk a little bit about that? Like I know realistically that is not the case, right? That yeah. there had to be some challenges. And can you talk about when you've had to pivot or concede it like, wow, this is a, a, a big mistake or a big moment and how are we going to, I, I like to say see, see it as an opportunity. But in the moment, sometimes it doesn't feel like an opportunity. Yeah. But yeah. Um, I mean, many, many times in other businesses, I ha we had all kinds of problems, but I'm gonna stick with Splunk. When we first uh, got funded, we had this technology that we were going to build, which was suspect. It, um, I think it would have taken people way smarter than me to figure out actually how to build it, although it sounded really, really good to the, to the VCs. And, um, but inside all that, there was this core search engine thing that was sort of part of it, but it wasn't really as important as this other thing. Um, when we got funded and we got our office uh, in Palo Alto at the time, we started working on this, and within about three months, we were like, we're getting nowhere with this. Uh, there's no way we're going to be able to build this thing. But if we built this little tiny search thing, you know, we could go out with that and maybe people would like it. Well, that little tiny search thing ended up being a huge business. And the original thing that we thought we were gonna build just made no sense whatsoever. So it was a huge mistake and we found the nugget in there and we switched to it, made that decision and it was huge. I'm gonna ask you a question that you didn't expect but it really reads off of this. It's like. How do did you and how do you stay motivated and focused with your goals over um, the long term, especially when you do face, face setbacks and challenges? How do you stay the course? I think. Is this working? Testing, no. testing. The most important thing to me was getting this out into the customer's hands and having the customer say, wow, this is really cool, this is how I'm gonna use it, this makes me happy, and I want more. And, um, and as we sold very small quantities of these things to just random, random groups, we started seeing, you know, in talking to them in person, we started seeing their smiles, we started seeing um, them going, this is really great, if you guys can make this 100 times faster, we can sell the hell out of it, you know, in, across the business. And so uh, that, it really, it was really talking to customers that, that, that did it for me. In your group, and I, I guess I come back to that because we know our, the audience and there can be a lot of challenges. And so 
I think for all of us, no matter what industry you work in or sector, it's how do you pick it up again on Monday, or maybe you never left it over the weekend, but how through, you know, challenges, seeking funding, the no's, you know, I think you're talking a little bit about once you knew you had that success, but there had to be, I just, I just want to dig into that little bit of personal driver, a takeaway for someone who's going to wake up tomorrow morning going, I, I'm done. I'm going to go get a job at Target. It's, like, I'm just yeah, done. I get it. Like, it's how the, do you want one more day? It's the micro successes. Like, there could be big, you know, times where where I'm just like so upset because we're not getting anywhere and, you know, and I'm not, I don't feel like we're making the progress, we're not making the sales, but through this whole process, there's, there are these little wins and every one of those little wins just brings me back to reality and says, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to keep doing this, whether it's, you know, wow, I can't believe you just doubled the speed of this thing. This is amazing. Maybe that means we'll be able to get more customers or looking in the customer's eyes and seeing them smile and then or 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 you know going to a conference and having you know a lot of people ask you a lot of questions every one of these little like like micro moments just said look I, I'm doing the right thing and we're gonna turn these micro moments into macro moments it's just that's what we're gonna do we have time or we where are we at because I know we're running okay got one more question for All you right. how did you build a repeatable sales model, right? Oh, How did yeah. you scale that to be something uh, more than just that initial concept? Right. Um, so we decided that we were gonna, go, going to sell to the people that were the actual users of the software, not, like I said before, not the C-level people on the golf course. So we actually were probably one of the inventors of the what they call the freemium model for um, enterprise software. That is, we give it away for free, and we land it inside of a business, and then we hope that they like it, and then they'll ask their bosses for more, and now they got to lay out a credit card, and then they'll ask their bosses for more, and up and up and up. So it's sort of an inverse model. Rather than selling from the top and going down, we start on the bottom and we go up. There were certain instances where we would go into a big company, like a big manufacturing company or a big financial company, and our software was downloaded off the internet and there were a million, there was like eight people in that business that were actually using our software. But they didn't know about each other. They didn't, they didn't know that this guy over here in this group's using it or this guy in this group's using it. Well, finally, we figured it out that uh, they found each other. They, they, they started asking their bosses and we then came in and started saying, well, maybe we need to do an enterprise level model where you guys can consume all you want for a certain price. Now we started selling down. So we came from the bottom up to the top down and did it both ways. But uh, you know, we had advertising all over the internet that was targeted directly at these guys with kilts and mohawks and uh, <laughs> Doc Martin boots. And we talked their language and we, you know, I can go on and on about this, but the idea was to get right at the people that the people that cared about this and have them sell their bosses, and it was just unbelievable how it took off uh, that way. Yeah. I want to thank you so much, Rob, for the conversation. <laughs> I think you inspire the audience, and we hope there's some good takeaways for today. Yeah, thank, thank you. you all. Thanks, Lorraine.